Welcome back to Doing Business in Bentonville, the Whiskered Warehouse Warrior Supply Chain. And Michael Z is here today with his whiskers, Elena, again out of place. Um, Harvey, did you think we'd make it to a second episode? I'm, I'm, the fans are like blowing us up. Like they can't wait for us to bring out more content. Yeah, no chance. No chance. Uh, zero. No. Uh, but we're here. You know, this is the greatest podcast in supply chain. In the history so of I was supply chain. So I told. That's what the viewer said. I mean, we're at 6.5 million viewers and growing, I think. That was the number I saw. Or it was 6.5. I couldn't, I couldn't tell at this point. That probably includes everybody's grandmothers and maybe, uh, you know, uh, siblings. So, yeah, we're probably at six, seven people. Cats, for sure. dogs. Arms, by the <laughs> way, you ready to be wild? Look at this. Boom. Boom. I'm still so bitter. Yeah, well, I'm bitter I didn't get a hoodie. If you do uh, a podcast today, if you if you add value, we can probably get one sent to you in the mail. Maybe even Michael Z can get one for being a, I saw that, for being a guest attendee. Maybe we can get him a Plug and place, little swag. Hoodie, yeah, baby, hoodie. Michael Z, before we, uh, and I love the Zeller, by the way. Michael Z, before we get started uh, on uh, the Mad Libs, give us the 15-second Michael Z bio overview. You got it. So, um, well, it was a cold winter when I was born. No, just kidding. Um, so, yes, I, uh, I'm i uh, from Southern California. I was part of the first round of the startup uh, internet boom in the uh, Y2K era. So I'm older than most of your attendees, I'm sure, your participants. I'm older this than is my fourth, my fourth tech startup. We are, uh, we've done uh, quite well in this uh, endeavor. I'm very fortunate to have Plug and Play as an investor and a partner in us. And today um, we are in all 50 states. And what we do is we um, help people with compliance and regulatory um, needs on demand. So we can basically have a localized talent person come out to the uh, environmental health and safety is where we focus. We'll go out to the sites and make sure that people stay safe, people stay ahead of their compliance and regulations. And um, it's very, very tech efficient. Love it. Love it. Elena, are you ready for your role today? Oh, yeah. So icebreaker, little uh, supply chain headline, Mad Libs. Um, so it's a company name, but I'm going to need two words. So I'm going to have Josh and Harvey, each of you, give me a word real fast. First thing that comes to mind. Headphone flower. Headphone flower. Okay. Um, Michael, a verb. Oh, run. Run? I was going to say that too. Um, Josh, I was gonna eat because I'm hungry. Herb. Eat because Harvey's hungry. Okay, and Harvey, what a dollar amount? Oh. A dollar amount? Mm -hmm. Trillion. Trillion. Just one trillion? Thick and small. Yeah. Okay, so head <laughs> headphone flower abruptly runs amid challenging VC climate despite eating a total of a trillion in funding. Oh my gosh! Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Welcome to the VC world right now. This is this is this is art imitating life at the moment with this Mad Libs game. All right, Michael. So we're back to you. Thank you, Elena, for amazing, fun talent to start off our day. Always happy, Sally. So give us give us the 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 synopsis on on Yellow Bird. What what are you guys doing? Who are you guys working right. with? Um, what's, what's, we're, we're in Bentonville right now and everybody's focused in CPG worlds and how would some of right. these folks want to work with you? Yeah. So, um, it's been a journey. So we are in our fourth year in the business that three behind us is actually for, from our third year celebration. So, um, I should probably take it down cause we're past that number now, but still reminds me of a good event. We started and continued to and stay true to the two-sided marketplace theory, except we've very much gone into um, technology and SaaS enablement. So what Yellowbird does foundationally is we take very uh, geeky people, uh, people who have backgrounds in insurance or loss control or health and safety, fire suppression and fire you know, regulations, all these Every single industry, and if you think of Bentonville, you, the, the number one thing from a Bentonville perspective is going to be moving product in, out, and around. So you deal with you deal with DOT, Department of Transportation. You deal with forklift safety, lifting, turning, uh, a lot of machinery, things to that effect. Every one of those is governed by not only OSHA, but also by the insurance 
regulations and it's a difficult thing to manage. And so what we've done is we've built a network that uses, and it, it, I actually made it, uh, yep, I made it three minutes. So we use AI and I know it's shocking. There's a technology company that uses AI. Nice job, we did. Mike. Really, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm, it's very important that I throw AI in at least at least twice in every ten seconds that I am on here. Um, but the reality is, is what we do, and the challenge in this industry is there's a hundred ways of saying the same thing. If and I'll give you an example, if you are dealing with uh, forklift safety, you could have a certification in heavy equipment. Uh, you could have a, a certification in uh, OSHA 30, which covers part of forklift safety. So as you're trying to do an assessment of, do you have the right people with the right training doing the right job? Often people don't even know what to look for or speak to. And so it gets very complex at scale. And so what we've done is basically we've built a, it's a little bit of a monster right now, to be honest. We've got about 7,000 people that are doing work all across the country, everything from construction and manufacturing to, uh, uh, we even go into things like uh, coal mines and confined spaces, um, and like super efficient. So that's that's our that's our deal. Um, thinking about the world of kind of LMS, like labor management systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. The approach I think that you're taking is is quite elegant in that you found a niche or a demand. Um, that it has not been currently serviced by your traditional legacy models or other startups in this space, right? Um, yeah. You've got folks that probably got started maybe like seven or eight years ago and they kind of went general, right? We're just going to yeah. be a marketplace for labor that's on demand and that's had some success, right? But mm -hmm. I think what you guys are doing is solving um, an immediate pain point, right? Pain that registers on a scale that it surpasses kind of your more general hiring. So kind of take us into that mindset that you had of how you're building your product for your customer in that way. Yeah. And it's really changed for us in the last 24 months and generalized labor. And it was what drove me to do this. Generalized labor tends to be commoditized labor. And so when I say that, you know, I always just say, you know, a pulse and a heartbeat will, uh, will get you and a driver's license will get you behind the wheel of an Uber or pack it, you know, stocking shelves or, or washing dishes. And it's an important role and it keeps the economy going. When you get into high skill labor, validating backgrounds, validating the ability to say this person is actually qualified to do the job. It's difficult within a labor organization and within HR, within recruiting to actually know what these, this alphabet soup behind these folks names mean. And just because they have the alphabet soup, do they actually understand it? So what we've done is we've designed in the last 24 months around verticalization. So in manufacturing or in construction, there are specific attributes that make them uniquely qualified for that type of work. And so now we're designing the, um, especially on the labor management systems, we're designing an API based strategy that when somebody says, I need somebody to go and do a, um, to oversee for four months while somebody is on maternity or paternity leave, we can't not have safety coverage. I need to hire somebody, but I don't want them to be full time because we do have this role coming back. Um, we're a perfect fit for that, that you can trigger that type of a job description into the platform that can send it out to the qualified people immediately. They're pre-vetted, they're background checked. We know who they are and what they want. And then based on the acceptances, we can actually give the, the sub sub, um, group. So we send the, the right people, say 10, 15, 20 people. Let's say we get five who accept, then we re-rank them to get the number one so that we save a massive amount of time. Um, API strategies are our future because everybody's going towards software. Um, the challenge with the software is that the software is designed today to raise a red flag is not actually designed to help people solve the problem. So, you know, we've identified a uh, risk in your near, like uh, camera systems. We saw a bunch of forklift near misses, or we saw somebody have something fall on top of them and we have a lawsuit or whatever that is. You've identified it, but what do you do to solve it? 
And so we are that trigger for solving. So our focus is actually to align with the software companies to solve, um, you know, what skills would be necessary to fix this. Mr. Z, so do you have any case studies or any public um, partnerships that you can share when company A utilized Yellowbird, this is what the ROI was, this is some of the, the data that you can share back as companies can start to figure out how to put pen to paper on on something like you would provide them? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But we do have, um, specifically in the insurance world, we did for a major uh, insurance organization, uh, we did uh, 360, I believe it was, uh, retail facilities. And those retail facilities were all across the country, and they wanted to do an assessment of risk that was standardized across all of them. So following the same guidelines, taking the same pictures, making sure that they set a benchmark. And the insurance organization actually said, we've always done spot checking. And so we go to one or two high risk or areas. Sometimes they ask their clients where to go, which by the way, they will never send you to the actual high risk places. Uh, clients are notorious to say, yeah, go to our brand new facility that just opened that meets every standard on earth. They don't send you to the you know, the dumpster fire that is the shop down the street that's been open for 20 years, right? And so we were able to execute that 350, 60, whatever the number was, in 90 days. It would have taken them uh, over a year. Wow. They would never have gotten them all. And it would have cost literally 75 to 100% more because we didn't have to, we had no per diems. We didn't have to travel. We didn't have all the extras. And so... I find the bigger dispersion of need of coverage, the better our solution works. But that was just benefit of scale. When you start, you can't do that. Um, but now we have the 50 states. Now we have the big marquee clients. Um, you know, there's a, there, you'd, you know the names of my clients, and so I can't necessarily name drop them on here, but there are some very big names that like our ability to execute quickly. And how do you how do you solve for the talent side of the equation, right? Because somebody's probably thinking, "There's no way I, I have I have this very specific right request. There's no way that Yellowbird has anyone that can do this." Yeah, you know, great question, appropriate question. Um, sometimes we do have to bring somebody in. Um, we have almost any specialty you can come up with now. Uh, we have relationships with the BCSP, which is the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. Um, we have relationships with the uh, National Safety Council. So we can we can align ourselves with the right organizations to find that talent. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, but uh, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Agency, if you have a building and you have sprinklers or you have any fire-related assessments, if you're managing real estate, you're doing these fire assessments. So we will go to the NFPA or we'll go to the volunteer fire uh, uh, council and give them uh, some kind of a benefit for in, in inviting their members to be available for this kind of work. But to answer your question, the right people in the right location is always the ambition. We do it most of the time. But if you have a nuclear power plant, I'm going to send my guy that I know here, Rob, from Phoenix that runs it was at SRP and go, all right, maybe you need to fly on an airplane to go out to do this nuclear assessment. And that's okay. It's a one-off. Um, I'm all right with that. Michael, when we introduce our founders within the plug and play network, Harvey and I are obviously very much on the supply chain side. It's pretty straightforward. We'll pick up the phone and we'll try to get somebody innovation team, the CBC team, the supply chain team. Who is the right person at company A to introduce you to? Because it's a very different dynamic than than many of the other folks that we're talking to. It is. It will fall under one of three areas. And it's they're very different areas. And it's one of the complexities of what we do. So you have to look at risk through different lenses. Human risk and then business risk. So Safety generally will fall under the CHRO at some point, the human resources officer, which sounds bizarre, but you, it is a function of me keeping your employees and their environments safe. So you will have, uh, from that perspective, maybe getting into the um, human resources, recruiting, that type of thing. We don't fit the mold of a, of a um, recruiter because we're much 
more cost effective. And we don't necessarily fit the role of a consultant because we are not a consulting agency. We are actually a platform. But that would all fall under HR. You then have the governance side where you'd have the C-suite, where you're dealing with big um, issues such as if you're a captive and you self-insure, a dollar saved on insurance is a dollar earned, and they have a lot of data around that. And we can use that data to help them put programs together to reduce risk. And so that would be the second area, which is legal and governance and insurance. So an organization, so, you know, Ben and Bill, so if you look at a Walmart or you look at a, you know, a Baby Hunt or you look at Tyson Foods, they all have likely a component of their risk that's self-insurance. And that would kind of roll under the governance side. And then there is always the operational side where, hey, somebody from OSHA showed up here or somebody from EPA or the fire marshal just came by and said, we don't have a fire plan for this facility. We don't have, um, we noticed that you have some barrels that are sitting on the ground and they're hazardous or marked hazardous materials. You need to have a hazardous spill plan. Those are the kinds of things that are one-off for us that we can do. So it's operations sometimes, Generally speaking, it's HR, but most, um, but on the outlier or the big impact things, it's actually going to be the, 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 the governance. So just a quick follow-up question on that. So do you see when you're talking to company A, a lot of this going, well, I don't own this, talk to this one, this one doesn't own it. Do you see you get passed around a little bit between some of these different functions? I do see that. I also um, see internal threat. Um, that people don't want to use our services because we have safety people. We have this covered. It's important. And what we try to communicate is, one, we are not a threat. There's no such thing as outsourcing safety. You need to have that internally. But the blocking and tackling of the function, we need to do a third-party assessment. We need to have somebody show up and review how they're actually doing. Um, Because a lot of the times, these safety departments even in a huge organization can only fit, be 15 or 20 people and they outsource, but it's really inconsistent. And um, the tech enablement of our platform is extremely powerful because you can actually run nationwide programs with one interface, which is almost impossible in this, in this industry. It's, you're, you're going to hire 30, 40, 50 consulting groups all doing things differently if you don't use the Yelber type of a platform. Got it. So, from a labor perspective, what are the main? Can I ask you guys a question? <laughs> yeah, time. only Josh. Yeah, all right. You're only allowed to ask. I'm going to gonna flip, I'm gonna flip the. I'm going to flip the script. You know, and Josh will. Josh will part to Elena because <laughs> yeah, Elena because, brain. Yeah, and and, brain. and, and it may require an adjective. So, ready. <laughs> 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 no, but in in your discussions, what are the big like drivers behind? the labor, you know, friction. It's not just shortage, it's friction. It's not being able to get the right resource in time for the need, especially if it's relatively short need or short order. Are you, what are you hearing from your corporate partners on just access to talent and things that, you know, somebody like us who can move fast should know? Do you have any insights? I mean, I'll, I'll weigh in first and then I'll turn it to Harvey since I can't punt the question. Um, it, it's interesting, the two geographies that I work in, both Savannah and Bentonville, um, both in non-tech-based side, sides of the country. Um, right. Walmart here is building a massive campus, and part of the reason is they want to attract and retain talent here. Um, sure. Savannah right now, they're bringing Hyundai in and creating thousands and thousands of jobs, and they just don't have enough bodies there. And so how do they find tech enabled solutions? Obviously coming out of COVID, the workforce has just changed so significantly for so many reasons. And I think labor tech right now, when we talk to corporate partners is among the top question. Uh, and when Harvey gets survey requests and asks labor tech is moving really, really quickly up, up the, the ladder. Now, what's the de- definition when you say labor tech, like what are they what are they looking to solve? Is it, you know, evaluation of, of CVs and resumes? Is it background checking? And what, what type of tech do they really, you know, lean into? 
Josh, you want me to step in front of this? Uh, bullet? I mean, I'm I just, just going to... Or you want to keep going? No, I think you should keep going. You're doing great. I, I think that from my lens, I mean, anything and everything in labor, Harvey, that's, that's a good umbrella to, to, to save the conversation. But anything and everything right now, I, I, I think it's that they're trying to put the right people in the right job at the right time and fit them within the right pay band. Um, and coming again, coming out of COVID, people have decided I changed a heart and I want to change my career. Um, I think yeah. there's people that don't want to do the entry level jobs and they also don't want automation to take those jobs away. So now there's a whole lot of friction going on in that space. So right. it, it's really, it's a, a talent, it's skill set, it's folks that want a more flexible ability to work from home. Well, you can't really do that in a deskless environment in many cases. It, it, it really has become a, a, a huge challenge from, from my lens uh, and one of the biggest things that we're trying to tackle. Harvey, what's what's your viewpoint yeah. on it? Anything I missed? Oh, my two cents. Okay, so I think it's two parts. One, um, to Michael's first question, I think labor is, it's an easy, um, buzzy word that yeah. people right. can relate to and that the media loves to harp on, but it's ambiguous. Um, right. I think labor right now is a much bigger problem um, in the minds of organizations versus I don't think it's translating very well to your day-to-day operations. Like there's certainly pain points there, but I don't think it's as fully realized yet as people are expecting it to be. So I think we have a little bit more uh, runway before it becomes an, an actual nightmare for people. Um, and people are trying to figure out how do I get ready? Uh, so. Be, okay, so it's a little bit ambiguous. The second thing, in terms of adoption from the startup perspective, you have another organization or you have another team inside that organization that has to now get involved, right? So for everybody else, you have a procurement team, um, mm-hmm. possibly, and then you have the business unit. If they want to do a POC or a pilot, they want to roll out a new project, they have autonomy, they have a they have a P&L, they can pay for this themselves. They don't even necessarily need to go to pure procurement or IT, they can just get it done. Well, if you have a warehouse or a transportation team that wants to do something with labor, they have to go to HR. Right. And so you have this other organization internally with its own processes and its own uh, red tape. And so you now have added more time to trying to get it something across the finish line inside of you know the labor umbrella when it comes to technology. And by the way, you might also have to go to IT, right? You might right. have to also go to a, a business unit to get buy-in and approval. So I think you do have more of the organization uh, you have, you've got to herd more cats, I think. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of the takeaway. That's the punchline. Yeah, um, I'm just you should say that. Oh, let's go, please, go ahead. No, no, no. Riff. Yeah. It's interesting you should say that because we actually, well, you know, I didn't mention this, but, you know, we're a DEI uh, organization. So we're actually a registered disability owned business. Um, you know, as you guys know, I was I was born with Respect. a big mouth, a big mouth in one hand. And so uh, I leverage both, um, especially on the golf course. But the most important thing from my perspective is when we go through this vendor onboarding, it does help us from that perspective. But you also can do one MSA and you do it once you get past that hurdle. You're not trying to solve for this 50, 60, 100 times. You're just doing it once. And so that's the other piece of the equation. If you have the patience to go down that path and you get through and it is not easy to get through the procurement process to become an HR vendor. Um, and they want to put you into, okay, what's your fee? You know, what's your fee structure? They're trying to put you into the way they've always done things. It's like, oh, no, you, no fee. Wait, what? Like they, their minds explode. They don't know what to do. And that actually can create friction. So I agree with what you're saying because you're right. They do want to put you through the same old, same old because that's their structure but I can save them 50% and make them move lightning fast. But you're not a, you're, you're not one of these buckets. So sorry. What was your other point that I just cut off? <laughs> yeah, we glossed over it, but you, you can certainly drive a ball further. I think than like 90% of the people on the course, I've seen you hit a golf ball. Uh, yeah. Well, and he's talking and smack on top of it too. He goes, Hey, who here with two hands can beat a guy with one hand? And everyone's looking around, and, and the answer typically is nobody. Like, I watched him hitting a golf ball, and he's talking smack, and he's beating the living daylights at everybody else. And they're going, Look at this guy go. He's crushing the ball. 
Trust sure. me, when I first, when I started golfing, I wasn't talking at all. I, I now know the guys that I can say that, the guys and gals I can say that to and the ones that I can't. <laughs> uh, my favorite joke is I walk up and people that I don't know me look at me and go, go, wow, I know, I know, man. I don't know how you guys do it with two hands. It's hard with one. <laughs> like, it's really impressive that you guys can play back. <laughs> And it's just very, uh, you know, it takes takes the the edge off because nobody nobody wants to be uptight on a golf course, and they can't be with me. Are you kidding? So, <laughs> well, you impressed everybody it's here a- at uh, the Bentonville Top Golf. You uh, you were the the winner by far. Uh, I think I was in last place. That's golf's not my thing, but um, you you uh, you were crushing balls here. People are, are just amazed at uh, at how good well, you were. I appreciate that. So that's Josh, why you, I, I, I have to play so you can keep me around, keep inviting me to these things. If I if I stunk it up, you'd be like, "Oh, I can't do that." So yeah, you know, that's my that's my goal. The other, just to finish, put a little bow on this conversation. The, the other thing, I think hiring is is top two. The other one is training and onboarding. In terms of like, yes. what are companies looking for? Yes. Training and onboarding seems to be the other big topic that folks are trying to figure out how to streamline and how to get better at. Retention, yeah. everyone wants more or better retention. Everybody wants more productivity. Again, I'm going to put those in like this weird, you know, yeah. gazy, fugazi, like ethereal concept that people aren't quite sure how to actually translate to real results with. But training and onboarding, you can affect. Hiring, you can affect. And so I think most people's efforts are, are focused in those two camps. That's actually where, candidly, that's where we're focused. So interestingly enough, when we brought on, we brought on somebody, uh, her name's Thais. She's our head of product from, she's a, she's a ways person, get from Google. And her, she saw a gap in our process, which was um, we had, you know, onboarding of professionals and they go and do federal, state, local background checks. And we do the certification checks and their CV and we actually link into various databases. So they're, we know who they are. They're financially ready. They meet all the criteria and the insurance. So we cover all the insurance. But then when somebody actually says, I need somebody to go out and do this loss control assessment, that's an example, or hazardous materials spill um, assessment that or training. I want you to do training per our guidelines, not per just OSHA or DOT, but for us. And I'll just say for the Walmarts in quotes, because I don't do this for them today, although I'd love to if you're listening. Um, the, uh, but the, the goal for us is to make sure that they're going to have a, a five-star experience. Well, there's a piece which is prepare for the job. And we didn't have that step. <laughs> I don't know how we didn't have that step, but we did not have that step. And she said, well, how can you make sure they have a five-star review if they don't have very clear expectation? And one of those is actually the pre-training of what success looks like. You know, you can run people through an LMS, a learning management system. You can do a mini quiz. You can do a video and say, hey, you're about to go out to our facilities. Here are our objectives. Here's what I want you to focus on as a customer, not us. The customer can say that to the professionals. They're doing the job. So we actually get out of the way from that perspective. But that onboarding and training piece, I've been thinking a lot about that of how to integrate more of that. So when somebody says, I'm worried that I'm, I need somebody for six months, but they need to meet our cultural needs and they need to understand our, you know, they need to do some studying before they could ever start here. How do we facilitate that as part of the platform? And so that's part of what we're focusing on over the next 12 months is adding in that piece of the component. Because I do think human bodies are not the solution. It's the right bodies with setting them up for success. Like, I, I, I never want people to have a bad experience. And defining a good experience is the hardest part. <laughs> really is. Now, Michael, uh, many CEO founders are on either coast or in Silicon Valley. They're always got a bunch in his Austin network, obviously up in Boston. You're in Arizona. I am. Tell us about your journey, what got you there, and how you're able to grow your business out of what wouldn't be a typical uh, hub for startup technology. Yeah. And and in Bentonville, uh, we're seeing a lot of the same thing where we're trying to build and grow founders here to morph out uh, out of this area here as well as a lot of talent. But Phoenix wouldn't typically be one of those startup hubs, and I'm just curious to your experience there. 
you know, you you have a really good in Bentonville specifically the ecosystem around the universities and leveraging um, leveraging the business school, leveraging you know Arkansas for what you are able to do for talent development and feed these younger companies, either empower them to start businesses or come in as young talent. We have a similar thing with ASU. ASU has done a really good job in innovation. And so you oh, since the meltdown in the real estate world of 08, there, which was all real estate here, everybody had some kind of a real estate tie in some capacity. And so it decimated everything in, in Phoenix. And we've gone into, as, an, as a community, you know, there's a lot of semiconductor business coming in here, you know, TCM, uh, TSMC and, and Intel and all these others. Micron. I mean, they're all here and they're growing. You have a lot of distribution coming in here and you have a lot of talent. We are getting more tech startups in here. And I believe the main driver for that, if I'm, you know, I'm one of these people who came from California. Um, I didn't come just because of the economic benefit because it's gotten more expensive here um, because Californians like myself have come in and everything was so inexpensive that they were willing to pay more and supply and demand drove up rates. Austin experienced the same thing. You know, it's when, when you become known for your, for your great community and your great environment and being less expensive, you suddenly become more expensive because it's competition. That being said, what we do as a company doesn't have to have localized talent all the time. And so we have 22 employees and I have the leverage of 7,000 people. And so we have the benefit of somebody goes, oh, well, they're not your full-time employees. I said, I could never run as quality of an organization as I run and have 7,000 employees that were sitting there on payroll needing to bill out at three to four X what we bill for because I've had to basically have them not working and then they go out and charge like they're never going to get another job. And so for us, um, the labor pool in Arizona has been really solid and growing plug and play coming in here and opening the plug and play tech center. I have enjoyed, you know, I know your team here. They've done a really great job. Um, they're bringing more VC and funding into this community, which is great. Love it. So that's been, that's all been part of this evolution from the real estate centric old model business that got pummeled. We learned, um, and I say we, I wasn't here, uh, but my, my family was my wife's and let's just call it what it is. I wouldn't be here if my wife wasn't born and raised here. My kids uh, wanted to be near their cousins and my wife was moving and I love her. And so I came with her. Um, so I uh, love her, my kids. And um, when they moved to Arizona, I decided that I would uh, join them and buy a house and stay with them. So it's well, a shout out to Dave <laughs> Ryan and Dean, the plug and play team in, in Arizona. They are doing some great stuff. And thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, they really are. And- um, at the Phoenix Open, they were able to keep me uh, well lubricated, but also not in the riffraff where people were sliding down the hill. They kept me actually away from all of that, which my wife and family were very appreciative of because I did not want to be on the news. So that was one of the reasons you do not want to be known at the Phoenix Open is for being one of those yahoos who slides down a hill in the mud. Um, there are many mothers that are rolling over right now going, that is my child and I cannot believe. <laughs> we are not them, by the way. Mike's son was not one of those. The news is good, but only when it's not involving crime and other things. So getting a little yellow bird visibility is good. Just make sure it's for the right things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, the other side of that coin is there's no such thing as bad press. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, let's be boy. honest. Oh, boy. Yes. All us made a spade. Yes, there is such a thing as bad press. Trust me, there are things that are uh, definitely I do not want to be known for. I won't put them on the airwaves right now because I don't do them. But uh, I'll tell you what, I can go near any school anytime I want, and that is a good thing. <laughs> well, your name is your brand, right? I mean, so that's, yeah, to your point, it's, it's important. Don't listen to Harvey. Here, Harvey, uh, don't just dis- <laughs> No, thank you. I stand by. <laughs> I stand by Mike. <laughs> love, it. love it. Love it. Michael, how do people find you? at uh www.theworldwideweb.yellow. World Wide Web, go into the interwebs. Uh, yeah, go, 
It's goyellowbird.com, G-O, yellowbird.com. Um, we are not a hot sauce company, although every now and then I do get yellow bird hot sauce um, um, complaints about an order come through our uh, through our form. I don't know how. They did not read our form enough to realize Harvey, we are not. We need in. to flood their inbox, Harvey, with, with complaints about yellow bird hot sauce. Uh, look, I'm a fan of both yellow birds. I've got the sriracha. I've got oh, yeah. the habanero, the whatever variety yep. pack they it's have off. right now. It's awesome. So, uh, so yeah, so so goyellowbird.com is the easiest way. The best part about our model, you can register, you can create a job, you can actually even open a job. You don't pay a darn thing until we match it. And we're doing some really cool things, including, just so you know, in February, we're giving 20% off. So if somebody wants to go on anything they want. So if they want to come in and say, hey, I want to do 100 location assessments for fire, you'll get 20% off of every one of those assessments. We're trying to uh, get people comfortable with using the platform. And, um, you know, these things, they used to cost 5000 bucks each uh, when you have an independent consulting company. Ours, on average, are about $1,400. And then you take 20% off. And it's very attainable. So if you're running a distribution or warehousing system or something like that, doing, you know, a hundred locations is very much affordable, especially if you take advantage of this, uh, this, these deals. And we're going to be rolling more of those, but, um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the pitch. Uh, I would love for, I'd love for anybody who doesn't use Yellowbird to try us because it's a really cool experience. It really is. I'm proud of it. Michael, thank you for joining us. And uh, you are an amazing individual and we love spending time with you. I love when you come to Bentonville and help make us a better uh, ecosystem here. Mr. Williams, any any final thoughts from you on labor tech, how we're investing, how we're seeing it? Uh, and you're in, I know you gave a little bit of uh, that earlier in the conversation, but I always want to give you the last word. Ooh, uh, let's see. I think recruiting is is it's something that's tangible again we talked about it earlier so you're seeing a lot more companies in that space so it can set it can probably feel a little bit crowded um yep. the other one training onboarding it's it's up and coming but we are starting to see tools that are being adopted from a software perspective the other category that i think folks should focus on which is it's it's kind of an extension of training onboarding it's that upskilling reskilling cross scaling yes right that's important Yes. Um, of course it's important. And, and a lot of people are talking about it, but not that many founders have cracked that code in terms of a product offering yet because right. it's so complex, but, 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 uh, with, uh, you know, another AI plug here with the advent of a lot of more accessible off the shelf generative AI, um, kind of infrastructure and middleware layers, uh, companies like Michaels are going to be able to become, you know, chat GBT ready where yes. you can start to ingest massive quantities of information and data from your training manuals to right. keep them updated, to keep them uh, more relevant and to allow your employees to actually start to finally transition out of some older jobs that boosts retention, that boosts happiness, that decreases, you know, your employee churn um, and ultimately drives more productivity. So I think that is a component while uh, I'll, I'll put it kind of in the gray area. You know, it's not quite tangible yet today, but I think it's coming. Um, and companies like Michael's and Yellowbird, again, are right in that perfect sweet spot to take advantage of it. Yeah, we're uh, something I like to talk about from that perspective is one of the things that I love about the upskill and reskill piece of this equation is I can take somebody who was driving a forklift, making minimum wage or just above, and make them into a bilingual or native language forklift trainer and they're they're making $75 an hour wow. is I mean it m meaningfully shifts in a way that can positively impact our society the challenge with it is is that often the upskill and reskill is going to upskill or reskill you at the same levels and not necessarily take your superpower and find a way for you to leverage that better take a welder and put them into welding safety or take somebody who has been in the oil and gas industry and maybe put them in the construction industry that has fundamentally many of the same um, deals. So I am super bullish on upskill and reskill. I just have to be really careful that we uh, focus right now. So we're not, we're not going too aggressively down that path because we have a lot of, we've, we've grown it as you guys know, we've grown it about 700% year over year. Um, 
it's an amazing which is crazy crazy in this last year yeah we went uh yeah, we went from uh, just under um, four hundred thousand to um, two point seven million, um, and it was a remarkable, um, remarkable journey. It's but only I the beginning. Also, be careful about that. Only the beginning, Don't my take friend. Take my eye off the ball. <laughs> well, thank you, and I look forward to going out to Bentonville. I've got lots of friends there. I'll see you in Savannah soon. I'll see you in Austin next week. And, uh, and oh yeah, anybody one good shout out. Good shout out. Agreed. We'll see you next week. Um, yes, sir. For other folks, if you have teams in Austin, we're hosting an event uh, February 21st. And then mm-hmm. um, we'd be happy to introduce you to Mike um, and actually a few of our other uh, guests that we uh, will be announcing shortly. So, Mike, thanks for joining us, man. Thank it's you. Fun. Always a pleasure. Keep up the good work. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the invite. I will. I love it. You found the guy with the biggest mouth that you could uh, find, and I hope I didn't disappoint. You were amazing. <laughs> like, that's why we call you. Nice, buddy. I appreciate that.